Good evening, everybody. And uh, you're very welcome to this evening's webinar, Let's Talk Equine. Delighted to have you with us. Um, Barry is joining us from Oliva in Spain, uh, where he's over at the, um, the Autumn Mediterranean uh, Tour. And delighted to have you with us, uh, Barry. Huge thanks to you. I know it's a bit later over there. And um, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. You're very welcome. So how are things going over there? Um, quite good. Uh, the weather is good, so horses and good weather always mix well. Um, we were sixth in the Grand Prix last weekend, and most of the other horses had a good placing. And uh, our student, Ella Clancy from uh, Donegal, she also had a couple of placings uh, this week, which was great. Uh, very good. So, yeah, look, I re really appreciate you making the time to meet us this evening. And um, the topic is to talk about, you know, the reality of trading horses for a living. And I, and I guess one of those realities is for you, at the mo like you are at the moment, is spending a lot of time on the road, in the air, at ringside and, and you know, away from home. So a lot of time on the road for you, Barry. Yeah, a lot of time on the road. Um, we're based in Malahide in Dublin, uh, where we spend, I'd say, about six months of the year abroad. Uh, the older your horses get, uh, the closer you get to FEI competitions, uh, the more time you spend abroad because of the selection of the shows and that. So we, we spend a lot of time abroad jumping at shows, finding horses, uh, trying horses internationally. So that's, yeah, we're, I've been used to that now for over 20 years. Yeah, yeah. And uh, of course, uh, home is Malahide and, um, you know, you're based very close to Dublin Airport. You have a very nice yard there and it's um, a super location for you in that regard from the perspective of, of, of clients coming in and out to you. Yes. Yeah, it, it, it's very handy. It's uh, being based in Ireland has a sort of marketing advantage in some way. Logistically, you're disadvantaged. Um, I was even talking to some of the riders based in England now. They're talking about, you know, maybe basing in the north of France. It's, every five or ten years, the whole scene changes. You know, it's, it was the Nations Cups. Everybody followed as the peak of their uh, sort of career. Now it's, they're on a GCT team. Yeah. Now championships, maybe the Nations Cups come back in popularity. So, it, you know, the sport is continuously changing, continuously changing. So you got to you got to try try at least to evolve with it and stay at pace. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And I suppose look at I mean by way of introductions to begin at this stage in the conversation, you know, you are a familiar face to many. Um, I, I certainly uh, know you the duration of my career at this stage, um, but you may not be familiar to all. And uh, so just from the perspective of putting that into a little bit of context, I mean, you you are a, an agent, you are a coach of young riders, you're very much involved ringside in that respect. But you have another, a number of other roles that you have engaged in in the sector. Um, you've been an advocate for the sector. You were very much one of the, the steering people behind the untapped potential report and that work with Jim Power and canvassing for the sector and all of that. Mm -hmm. And um, I suppose, you know, what some may or may not be. On the, to click that link that he put in the group. Sorry. And download the app that it tells you it's a Sorry, the app. other person speaking just needs yeah. to um, okay. yeah, yeah, quit there. Uh, Jenny, whomever is, because we can hear it. Um yeah. The the um, work that you do as well with the RDS, with the show jumping committee there and the equestrian committee and so forth. And you, you play a number of different roles, maybe, maybe for people just to also, I suppose, put a little into a little bit of context what the business model is at home and 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 what you do in that regard in your day to day. Um, the business model is, uh, to be yeah. honest, it started off on my own uh, a good while ago. I had 10 years together with Connor Swale. Then Connor went and did his own thing in sort of North America. Then I had uh, Philip McGuan. I think he was with me for five years. We did... Uh, a lot of sort of uh, younger horses up to and peaked them at you know seven and eight we sold them at that stage we did a lot of um, uh, rehab horses as well for clients in america because we have a water treadmill at home mm -hmm. well Albert was with me for a year and we we just concentrate on five and six year olds and now in the last couple of years um uh, jenny rankin and nisha wilson have joined me and you, you know we're concentrating basically on 
sort of seven, eight year olds and upwards. We, we carry some younger horses. Uh, we do we do have uh, Jenny buy some foals and I, I have a couple of mares. I'm really that interested in the breeding, I'll be honest with you. I, I rather than when they're like five and six years of age, you know, only a couple of years, seasons away from a potential customer. Mm. So we're trying to build up a team of horses, investors, clients, and be sort of based more at international shows. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you are, whether you have the major interest or not in it, you also are a breeder of sorts yourself in that you, yes. you said to me you have three mares. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm interested. In, I, I've always been a little bit frustrated with the place that Ireland takes internationally. Mm -hmm. um, it, it has changed a lot in the last 10 years. I was probably, I've shown my age now, but I was probably there for the, the latter years of uh, Paul Dara, Eddie Mack, and when we were like we walked on water, and then we completely lost our we completely lost our focus. We listened to old wives' tales about breeding. Uh, we went off on stupid tangents, uh, and we never listened to the market. Mm -hmm. And the Belgians, the Dutch, and the French they took us over at hundred miles an hour, mm -hmm. and they have such a huge uh, 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 sort of uh, just a huge sort of strength and depth in in their breeding program. And we, we just to emphasize that we are talking here about show jumping. That, oh, that, yeah. show jumping. The, the the other I touch off the other ones when. Mm -hmm once a year or something like maybe the, the odd event or something like that, but wouldn't know anything else, wouldn't be that very pay with it. But however, in the last 10 years, the, the one thing that we have, uh, we're very close to America. We have more, way more Irish people based in America than any other European nation, I think. Um, we have fantastic horsemen and women. Our, our, the standard of our riding per capita is something to be incredibly proud of. And I don't mean that in the sort of... Uh, uh, I, I'm very genuine about that. I'm not, I'm not, you know, pretending on that stage. Like our young riders, our ponies, the standard that they ride to is is fantastic. The the, 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 the metal trawl that has come in over the yeah. last while, you know, yeah, it is incredible. And the breeding has changed. Now you talk to breeders. I I judged a class in the north, a three year old class in the north. I think it was eight or nine years ago. And just as an experiment, I was bored. Um, I asked each breeder that came in, what did the mayor do? And we had 33 or 34 three-year-olds. What did the, the, the mother do of the three? And I think one of them had jumped 110 or 120. Somebody said, oh, this one's jumped out far. And I think it jumped in an amateur class in Hickstead. That was out far and what that meant at the time. But now you go to a full sales and the breeder has the page, uh, the black type, uh, video of a relation. We're, we're, we're tuned into it. We're switched on to it. Mm -hmm. But from, from the point of view that you that you now also say you have three mares yourself at home and you've had the experience of producing foals yep. and have you have you sold those foals kept those foals have you what what has been the voyage with those? Well, um, there were mares that came out of uh, one was bought to breed because of a relation of a a, a good horse uh, that I had and I bought that because of nostalgia which you shouldn't um, but I really like the honest. horse. Yeah. yeah. And um, I think we have uh, we have uh, two out of that at the moment, but they're untried at the moment. Mm -hmm. So and that's one. Another one got injured. It, it had quite good breeding. It was a Bavarian five year old champion, jumped up to the seven, eight year olds, jumped 140s, had an injury. And I sold the foal of that in. Um, oh, sorry. I still have the foal of that. Um, and then I have another one that I had bought but got an injury, but it was a beautiful mare and we sold a foal in Cavan last year. Mm -hmm. I had a 50-50 a deal done with a person that breeds the foal for me and they did a fantastic job and, and we sold it last year uh, in Cavan. I think it was a 12 and a half or something like that. Mm -hmm. But I suppose the reason I'm going here at all for people at home, for breeders at home who may be not, not as familiar with you is, is at least from the perspective that you, you know, you spend so much time ringside and as you say, your interest is in those older horses, but you also have experienced it from the seat of the breeder as well. And you haven't, you, you, you've, you've had the perspective of not always having the luxury of going specifically to the shop window to pick what you want as well. Yeah. So yeah. You, have, you have that experience also. Um, and I suppose, you know, 
just to emphasize to viewers out there and we have a lot of people online this evening and thank you very much to all of you for taking the time to be with us really really appreciate that uh, this forum is here to allow you to, to to send in your questions as well i'm going to kick things off a little bit to start with but by all means i would love to see some questions coming in and i'll have a look at those in a in a, in a wee little while you know so um what i wanted to talk to you a little bit to start with barry is around you know, I suppose there's a lot of breeders out there that, you know, they may have a fold that they think quite a lot of, but, you know, perhaps they don't have the skill or the, you know, facility even perhaps to bring it on to the next stages and go on up the ages. Can it be, are there other options there? Are there other, other mechanisms that you've engaged with breeders with or ownership um, mechanisms that you engage with breeders with? What's your, what's your pennies worth around that whole area? Yeah, well, a lot of the successful breeders that have Richard that I know personally, you know, in, in, in mainland Europe and in Ireland that I would personally know, they like to sell all of their folds by the end of October. And they, they they target sales for them. They target private clients. They look up uh, before the start of the year. They would find out who has the brothers and sisters of the foal that would come on the ground. They ring them. They contact them. If they're international, they'll send them messages. If they haven't got their number, they'll be on Instagram, on Facebook. They, they're actually good at sales. You can't you can't be a successful breeder. You can't just be a horse person. Uh, you have to actually be a salesperson as well. And if you're no good at that, you have to find someone that will help you do it, whether it's a neighbor, an uncle, an aunt, a son, a brother, uh, whatever it is, you have to get a, get a hand with that. Um, if you want to keep the, uh, I think your question is, if you want to keep a foal, what are your options in selling it, bringing it to market? So um, the, it's really the cost, you know, the, uh, uh, I would, you, if you're going to, it's not worth anything really until it's a three-year-old. The next time, you, the next sales cycle is a three-year-old. The next sales cycle is that is four-year-old. And then it's every year, probably through the age classes. Um, I don't know many people that do it at folds. Uh, they probably do it from three-year-olds on. They hold it as a three-year-old. I would, I would recommend to breeders to uh, have their uh, three-year-old X-ray have it broken professionally, have it well handled. And then if they want to do a deal with a rider, they will say something along the lines of, um, I've put 5,000 into this, we'll split everything over five. Uh, and at the end, you take out your expense, expenses, agree the expense beforehand. It, it, you have to find someone, A, you trust. That's Excellent. the most important thing. Yeah. The most important thing. Yeah. If you don't trust them, don't do business with them. You, you know, and. And you and you laugh together and cry together is a, is a is a Dutch saying. So you know you're going to win and you're going to lose. And sometimes you know it's better to do a couple of them together rather than just one at a time. You know it kind of evens out the odds a little bit. Mm -hmm. yeah. I I always find that even if your horse is X-rayed well, it looks well. It's a nice model. It's broken quite. One in three is the dud. Mm, 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 mm. and you know think the expect expectations are not always met and things don't always go to plan and you know yeah. sometimes the exit clause is required exactly exactly mm -hmm. I, at the moment there's some fantastic prices got from horses and people have to realize why it is during covid a lot of people you know most of the world's governments so supported people to stay at home mm -hmm. uh, and they stayed at home the one thing you could do during covid is go and look after your horses mm -hmm. so the popularity of horses grew in scandinavia america mm -hmm. uh, england our our three biggest our, our three biggest markets mm -hmm. and therefore the need of the horses was good uh, like the numbers going to the numbers going during covid to america for eventers was as strong as it was pre-COVID and it got even a little stronger in the last year. That's the numbers flying for adventures. Mm -hmm. but the price has only crept up a little bit mm -hmm. because more and more people got into it. Mm -hmm. uh, the shows now have started back in real earnest and, the, and especially the shows in America, the, the mm -hmm. amount of shows on, it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger at the higher level. And you can hear a lot of higher prices being got for horses, but mm -hmm. You know, that's horses probably at the top end of their sport, whether they're winning in Lanarkin or they're winning in Dublin or they're a very good international FEI horse. Mm. But it's not even just those horses. I mean, we're hearing like there's even there in, in, in Zangerside, there was some 
very significant uh, prices for foals made. But coming back to here at home, you know, I mean, you were you were involved in the the purchase of a foal through the the um, Barnadown sale there a couple of weeks back, and you know there was sales in Cavan there recently, and some very nice prices came through there again. Um, I did want to chat to you a little bit around the idea, you know, like you you act as an agent for people um, in purchasing foals and older horses, um, you know, valuing foals and realistically valuing foals. And uh, I suppose, you know, engaging with somebody who as a customer and finding that that ceiling pre-sale, you know, how, how do you how do you have formulas? Do you have what's your what's your your um your mechanism for, for for figuring that out have you one is there one uh, most of it is yeah 50 30 percent is sort of horsemanship 20 percent is common sense and 50 percent is emotion yeah uh, i don't think people you know what is a show jumping horse you know i know it's a i say it a lot of times but for me it's a domesticated farm animal to jump colored sticks for people's enjoyment. You know, it's not a, you can't heat your house with it. You can't go to work with it unless you're on a flying machine a hundred years ago, but uh, you can't, you can't eat them, you know? So what, what it's for people's enjoy. It's a luxury item. So mm. we just had to realize, you know, what we're selling, you know what I mean? It's not like a, a you know, cattle off the farm or sheep, or it, it's a, it's a very, very odd commodity. And most of the value in a horse is the emotional value. So, because sometimes people will buy a horse because it's related to a good horse, you, you know, because, you know, the James Can Cruise foal that was bought down in the, in the Bernadown Goresbridge horse sale, stuff like that. You know, the, the person buying James Can Cruise, you know, it's, it's probably the best horse in the world at the moment, bar none, it's on the, at the moment. And bar an injury, I hope that I hope I hope for the breeder owners and the riders that they that they win a, an Olympic medal in a couple of years. But um, the emotion value behind it there was two bidders in it and they went and they gave twenty six thousand for it you, you know if if that foal was you know it's, it was quite a nice foal at a fantastic canter uh, the breeding was good but if that was not related to another horse i you know could have made a half or a third of that value mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, when you're looking it's bloodlines people are buying on bloodlines now. go and look at the animal and unless it's a weed or it's turned in or it's yeah. awful ugly or you know it's too plain uh, plain any plain foal is, is, is actually quite hard to sell at the moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, uh, you, you know, people will buy off the, once everything, once the, the basics are good and the bloodline, is, they'll buy off the bloodline more than the model. They used to buy off the model more than the bloodline, but the bloodline comes first. Mm -hmm. Like if I bloodline, I just keep flicking the pages. If it's by a sire that I hate, and there's a lot of them I do hate, mm -hmm. because three or four of them and they're all the same attributes. Mm -hmm. uh, which means to make them difficult to sell. I just keep flicking the catalog. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, I suppose, you know, it, it, each of these situations, they're all individual to themselves as well, too. Um, but um, yeah, like I suppose, you know, as well at the at this at the point of falls, you know, there's still a long road to go. There's still a lot can go wrong. There's a lot can go right. You still don't have a, a take on the soundness perspective at that stage as yet. And that plays such a big role later on. Yeah. The soundness is the soundness is the big thing. Um, you know, for for me, soundness most of the soundness comes from movement. Whatever's inside the horse, inside the horse. Yeah, um, but movement is the first thing. Most foals move well. It's a god. You know, they're always fresh and you know scampering about. You know, and you know it's hard to say. You know, 90, 80, 90 percent of them, you know, move well uh, because of you know at that stage of their lives, you know, they're light on their feet, they weigh bloody nothing anyway, you know. But um, it's easy to pick out a bad mover out of that bunch. Um, but sound is sound is very very important. And uh, there's a few things I went to a talk once about uh, the chips in, in, in a, a chip in a, a chip in a joint, uh, especially you know in the front of the fetlock joints. Uh, or, or maybe well, anything in the foot is a no-no, but any of the chips can be caused from bad management, you know, overfeeding, uh, bad ground, uh, a horse's house too close together, too many in a pen. You know, there's a lot of things a breeder can do to uh, uh, negate that, uh, you know, that risk for themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what they can do probably when they house the, 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 the horses in winter. 
uh, as a three-year-old, before I would spend one euro on it, I would take a set of x-rays. If there's a chip in it and it's only a small one, it might dissolve, I'd leave it. If they're bad x-rays, I wouldn't spend another euro on it, unless it's an incredible jumper. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the foot care and the shoeing. I, I think we can, I'll be honest with you, I think we can be slack on that a little bit here. Um, they want to be pulled out every, you know, couple of months, uh, weeks with foals, making sure that they're straight, et cetera, you know. Yeah. But, there, was a, uh, there was actually a, um, a question in here from from um, one of our viewers around, you know, what would you forgive confirmation wise? And I suppose the flip to that is what you won't forgive. Um, I won't forgive bad balance. Mm. Bad balance, you know, a horses that are short of their neck. And when you sit on them, there's absolutely nothing in front of you. They're hard. The horses that are on the forehand, mm. oh, hate them. Mm. And maybe oh, they hate them because the clients hate them. You know, you some client, oh my God, where are the ears? You know what I mean? Like, uh, they, you know, they think they're going to fall off. There's no sense of safety in it. They're not upright horses. Mm -hmm. I, I, um, I don't like them straight in the front legs, uh, like very straight at the pasture. And what else? I, I, I forgive a lot because, you, you know, it's good canters. A good, if a horse is comfortable, and it has a couple of chips on it. It's got a little makes a little noise if it's got a few. But if it's really comfortable and balanced and it looks good, there's a job for it. But the uglier it is, and the more unbalanced it is, and the harder it is to ride, you know, uh, um, the, the, the more difficult it gets. Everybody has a shopping list, you know. And according to according to your price, you know, you'll forgive a little this, a little that, a little the other, you know. Uh, the one oh yeah, the one thing that I won't forgive is lack of blood. Yeah. If they don't have blood. Rich, rich kids don't like to kick, mm -hmm. not horses. Mm -hmm. So you are talking mm -hmm. about, you know, reflexes and all of that. Blood, you know, heavy yeah. can, yeah. you know, no chance. Yeah. That's the no, no. Um, before, um, before I move, move away from kind of the younger ones, there is a query in here. Um, what's the best way for breeders to source an interesting well-bred mare from top sport with proven or obvious performance ability? Um, with a view to using such a mare as a foundation mare or an upgrade for the breeding program. There's one for you. How do you get a good black type mare, really, is it? Yeah. I think you have to be clever with it. You're not going to find them in the buy and sell. You're not going to find them in balance slow. You're not going to find them at say, offered at sales. You're going to have to do a bit of detective work. You're going to have to... Uh, you're going to have to pick a line, you know, and uh, uh, you go on to horse telex and then you go down through it. You see how close can you buy to the line? Who's the breeder? Send them a message. Find them. You know, th this is like buying stocks and shares. If anybody, you, you know, follows mm -hmm. sort of uh, uh, um, um, videos or uh, YouTube videos of Warren Buffett of how he picks, how he picks uh, uh, stock. You know what I mean? He really, you know, reads the report on them. Now, our report is the FEI results, national results um videos you, you know you really have to get into the information you won't get it for free if you think about it what is a foundation mayor a foundation mayor can can supplement your income it can send your kids to college can uh, can buy you the small farm next door it could do anything for you so you have to spend time at it it might take you a couple of years to get it, yeah. it you might never get one in a lifetime you might have just good commercial mares but finding them i have professional breeders asking me all the time but you have to be very, 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 very quick and fast. One way that people could do it is maybe go to a foal sale, see a black type foal and buy it between three breeders and then have a, get a contract, please, and write it down who gets the first, the second, the third, the fourth. And that would be one way that I would do that. Definitely. I would do that. And that, that way you can get straight into it. You know, I know you have to wait a bit of time, but I'd rather be waiting for a good mare on the ground than, you know, looking up at the mountain. Mm -hmm. And just on that point, like when we, when we, when you talk about the idea of people being in partnership with each other, like you, yeah. you advocate for formal agreements with, you know, exit clauses and all of that, or what's your, what's your experience in that regard? Well, Sorry, come again. Handshakes. handshakes. I've never I've had I've had handshakes because they'll always be friends and people in the sport and professional. Mm -hmm. So if they any shenanigans and it just goes around and you know that'd be it. You know I've had a, I've had a few 
arguments over the times to sell and what we thought of the horses and, and valuations, but you have to have the trust because at one stage or the other, somebody will, will pick up the phone and say, hey, I'm just going to refuse this money for this horse or we need to pull this one out. And if you don't have the trust that they're correct with the figures, then you have nothing. Mm. I, I, I don't think a contract can create that. However, um, if you're going, I, I would recommend that until you have built up relationships, mm. which I'm you know, to have in my yeah. life, yeah. people around me that mm. I've dealt with, I've some going back 20 years, you know, and, and I trust them, mm. I trust them. You know? Can I ask about, like you spend so much time ringside yourself mm. here abroad. Do you meet many breeders? Ringside, yeah, all the time, all the time. Okay. All the breeders are getting more and more into the sport. One of the reasons the breeding fell off in Ireland is because we don't have really high end Grand Prix around the country. We have good national Grand Prix, but there's probably only four or five proper Grand Prix. And to see really, really good horses, you should probably be in Dublin to watch them like five star horses. Where else would we get? You know, I know we have Mill Street, Balmoral, Cavan, and I'm probably thinking, I can't think of one. And, you know, we've good, good classes and a lot of other play. Oh, uh, Mullingar as well. I, I know I'm going to get in trouble for forgetting one, but sure, what the hell. But the, the problem is that, you know, now with phones and, and screens and stuff, you can get to see, you know, you can get to see as many classes as you want, but clip my horse or uh, one of those good services. But to really go to a warm up ring and see the blood of the horses, see, uh, um, you know, see the size of them. That's another thing. See the, the canter and the scope of them, the makeup and the expression of them. You know, that's there. There's there's not a lot of there's the odd exception to the rule. You know, we had Japalu when Japalu bred every person in Ireland said, oh, Japalu was only 15, three, where there was only been one of them and everything else was bloody pony, you know, mm -hmm. so you know there's no more tiny tiny horses doing it the, the way he used to do it you know mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But your point is being ringside yes i see more and more breeders all the time they go to lana mm -hmm. and the huge amount of breeders go to lana but i would encourage them to go to different shows mm -hmm. i would encourage them to go to the young horse shows in uh, jev the, the the belgium finals the mm -hmm. the german finals at Fonds championnat uh, uh, mm -hmm. where they can see 20 horses bred by the same stallion and they can pick that stallion and say mm -hmm. I, I like the attributes of this one or you know every second one was turned in in front or every second one of these ones were stuffy you know I, I think that would be very open you got to get on the road you got to mm -hmm. do your research mm -hmm. you can I'm sure yeah you can do huge, yeah. huge amount via, via phone uh, laptop or whatever but, you, but nothing beats you know standing and looking at a horse and I, and you know, saying you know that line is too much. Uh, that line is kind of unrideable. That line hasn't got enough blood. Mm -hmm. it's very important. If you put the work in, you'll get it out. You know, mm -hmm. you get it out and get networking. You have to get your information, get your own leads. You, you know, find mm -hmm. your own. That's what makes it exciting as well. It's all possible. Mm -hmm. It's all and, and and building the the networks and building the relationships as well that then allow you to perhaps negotiate or navigate other forms of ownership that maybe might you know go a little bit further along the road and a little bit more of a dividend with that and I do want to talk you know a little bit more about the kind of the four-year-old plus and moving moving up the age classes now so you know like you you move up the ages the the costs involved of you know producing them that starts to change like yeah. can you give a, a bit of an you know even from your own perspective like the average reflection of let's say the difference between being out with your four-year-old your five-year-old your six-year-old and then moving into that that next class up where you're out and you're you're going to tours like you're at at the moment and and, and that can you give a little bit of a perspective on, on the costs that are involved the 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 cost from your pocket if you're doing it yourself so if we were doing a four-year-old ourselves and we'll have it in for seven months of the year six or seven months of the year i think well it depends on how many staff you have and the facilities you have but you could definitely write you know pure cost now, i'm not talking the cost of your of your stable or your land but i, I you know, just a bit of your time, you know, if you break it down, if you've got a Jeep and trailer, who's paying the diesel, who's bought the trailer, who's the wear and tear, you know, you put all these things down. You're probably, I, for us, five, seven, five to 7,000. Mm -hmm. And that's a four-year-old. But I don't like going to, I wouldn't go to a lot of those, you know, a lot of those bigger shows with them. I, um, 
you know, the stay over shows add a huge amount of money to it. A lot of day shows. Mm-hmm. Uh, five roads depends on the horse. It depends on, you know, for me, it depends on the exit on the horse. I always have an exit for the horse. This horse is good enough to go all the way. Mm-hmm. This horse will be sold as a potential five year old. This horse will be sold as a seven, eight year old. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, it's, it's the exit on the way. Um, so I suppose, what, are, what, are the, what are the ticks that it needs to make at four? What are the ticks it needs to make at five? What, oh, are, the tick, what, what are the, you know? Uh, well, the first thing is it has to be well broken. Mm. If you, you want to blow money on horses, get your horse, send it to Mickey or Johnny down the road who tries to break it in one day and take it back after two weeks because he only charges 80 a week. There's so many people that do that. The horse is a lunatic. You can't get on it. Uh, you know, it's it's badly broken. It's it's um, it, it, you should spend the money on it. If you've X-rayed it, you've handled it, you've loose schooled it, you like it. Spend the money on it. It's the best money you'll ever spend, ever, ever, ever spend. And it's the most value that you can add to the horse. The most value you can add to them. If you're able to get get on a mounting block, get on a horse, trot it in a straight line, be on the bit. It, uh, as a as a just like as a start of a four year old year, canter down to a cross pole or a trot pole in front of a cross pole or, or a small little vertical or something. Mm-hmm. If you're able to back it around, canter around the outside of its field on each leg, you know that's worth money. Mm-hmm. But if it if it's in any way sharp, if it's in any any way sharp, you have absolutely no chance whatsoever to to sell it for a while. It has to be a hell of a company and a professional will have to buy it. So that's what it would have to be at the beginning of the four-year-old. By the end of the four-year-old year, it should be able to canter around end of the four-year-old, September to December. It should be able to jump maybe a soft 110 a meter. It should be able to change its legs mm-hmm. yeah, with lead changes. Because mm-hmm. that balance, you know, it should, it should be able to go with a snap up. By the five-year-olds, by the end of the five-year-old year, it should, uh, you, you know, it should be showing you carefulness, scope, uh, good ride ability, uh, uh, be able to shorten and lengthen well, and it should be able to at the end of the year jump 120. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it depends on the exit. You know, there's there's a lot of young horse classes. You have to be very. I, I see a lot, a lot of breeders entering in every ODS qualifier, a, every HSI class, which which is a very good thing. But you, you pick and choose. There's nearly too many classes. Five year olds. End of the six year old year, they should be able to jump 130. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you should be able to just start edge to see are they a little bit competitive you know you know how many gears have they got can they turn back can they look not that you'd go fast but you know you may be in a jump off you might take a little sort of an inside line or something like that. and as a seven-year-old then you should say this is a, a an amateur trade horse which is still worth money or this is an fei horse mm-hmm. and i suppose like just going backtrack a second like you you said five to seven k might be the expenditure yep. on, on, on average for your four-year-old ramping that up to the age class like if you when you when you hit the seven-year-old stage shall we say what are your potential expenditures at that stage on average um so for for a five-year-old if you have it on livery let's say you have it on 10 months livery uh, nine months delivery that's uh five and a half grand roughly people charge around 800 on average um and then on top of that you'll probably have about another three thousand for shows or something like that you know show shoeing and that's that's soft year but you kind of you do dublin lanark and you know you chase some of those shows you can add five or six thousand maybe mm-hmm. some people are more expensive uh, you know um it depends on what you do. It depends on where your horse is. See, if your horse is broken well, it won't need as many months mm. as a fight. Mm. Uh, it, uh, it, you know, it won't need repairing from a, a, a professional, you know. Mm. Uh, six-year-old, the same. Seven-year-old, that's when, you know, you should start to do maybe a few shows abroad. We would always aim them at the seven, eight-year-olds in Dublin. It, it depends. A trip abroad like this per horse from... from home to here and back again you're talking around talking about six thousand for three weeks and people oh my god you can do it cheaper mm, yeah but your flights for yourself uh you're you're eating out all the time if you're a terrible cook like me um can't just live on cornflakes um you are uh you transport on the way down you know wear and tear in your truck uh, it's a long way in a truck and one in four times you either have a tire or a little problem or a big problem like I had a few the year before last. Uh, then you have, if you have people working with you, you know, you 
put them up somewhere. You, you know, there's roughly if you, if you budget that for for, for a, th a three uh, a week uh, tour, you won't go. You won't be far wrong with it. You know. And then if we taking all of that into account, sort of look at, I suppose, you know, let's say you're in the top ten percent of the four year olds, the top ten percent of the five year olds, six year olds, etc. Uh, I'm pushing you here, Barry, but what could you what could you expect market value wise to, you know, be thinking about or ballparking in that regard then? Um, you see, is that is that a, a fair no, no. question? Yeah. No, that, that, that's a fair question. That's a fair question. Um, see, no one ever wants to talk about it because no, nobody, it, nobody wants to talk about money. You see, so uh, we, 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 we might be being a little bit whatever this evening, but let's let's see. <laughs> um, uh, let me think. Your question is, what would a fair market price be? What should you expect? Is it well, if you put this investment in and you're in that top five percent, that top ten percent of those those various age classes going along, and you you know you've made the investment in 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 the um you know in the training in the in the work and attending the shows and doing all what can you expect to get back i don't think you can expect to get anything back you're 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 at the what casino can you hope to get what can you hope <laughs> okay well first i move my words from expectation to hope every day you got to know what it stands for you know what i mean you're standing in 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 lanarkin and you've refused 10,000 for your fold because obviously you've got a bit of black type or something. You sent it to a professional. You know, you've spent 15,000 on it. So your fold costs you maybe, you know, a good semen from abroad. Maybe it was an embryo. Maybe it cost you seven or eight. Let's say it cost you 10,000 as a yearling uh, by the time you have it all done. done. And you spend another, you know, 20, 25,000 on it. Or let's say 20, you're standing at 30,000 in Lanarkin. When someone comes and asks you the price, you've got to ask yourself, how many more grades can this go up? Yes. Is is it scope enough? You know, has it got a big enough canter? You you should you should only fall in love with a you know a person. You should never fall in love with a horse. You know, um, but they, they'll never say I love you back. But um, you you have to re. It's a gamble. It's it's all a gamble. You, you know, and I don't think people get that. You know, they say well. Mary got a hundred thousand for theirs, so I should ask a hundred thousand for mine. It's it, I would always get advice from people in the industry that you trust with good names. How would you value my horse? It is the hardest thing in the world. I would have people. I have one person at the moment that I told them I thought the horse was at. They should ask forty thousand. They said they want to ask a hundred thousand. Okay. I said, mm -hmm, okay, best luck to you. Bye bye. You know, and one in fifty might be right and get this some lunatic that'll give them too much money for it but most of the time uh, you know i'm around the, the same you know i'd be around the right value but i would say um horses that jump the medium tour which is 135 in america mm -hmm. they are sound they are rideable they are good looking and they're easy so you know they, they have all the attributes now if yours is a bit stiff in the mouth it's a bit plain. It's got bad x-rays. You can ship 25% off each of them. In America, it should be able to sell for $150,000. However, you have got a flight and you've got a profit margin for the, for, for the, and a commission for the, for the person buying and selling it. Mm -hmm. So that to me would be, so really you're talking about $100,000 uh, $100, for something nice to peak out at one thirty-five. dollars so that's probably what I, I know the dollar is low at the moment. So maybe it's one for one, but maybe 70, 80 grand for something that's seven and eight to jump 135. Now, if you're missing, but there's, it's very rare to find a horse with all those attributes. So mm -hmm. I would. That's a lot of boxes to tick. Yeah. 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 You know, it's got a couple of chips. It's a bad move. It's a bit stiff to the right. Tick, 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 boom. You know, you, you have to go down. And the breeder has should spot these things. Don't forgive them on the way up. You know, it might have this fantastic back end, you know what I mean? But, you, you know, it's, it's got, you know, stiff front legs. It's, 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 it's hard to ride. You know, somebody is the pin of their collar and white knuckle rides around it. It might qualify for Dublin. It almost be worth 200 grand. No, it's not. It's not easy enough because 95% of the sales of horses are far amateurs to jump less than 140. Mm -hmm. uh, 
you know, and, and then the rest, there's, there's a lot of professionals who want to buy it for the sport, or there's amateur professionals who want to buy it for the sport. Uh, is, the, is the other, you know, five or 10% of the top. So really that's, that's, that's my, you know, what did Gordon, Gordon Gecko say, you know, greed is good, you know, it, it keeps us all in it, but you, you got to know when to pull it. You got to know when to pull the lever and get out. And, and, and it is, it is an incredible gamble. I have seen more people in my life and I'm not talking that I, you know, everybody should take a gamble. If, if you don't have to live off it, you know, push it out a little bit, but make sure you're getting the right advice. Don't, don't, you know, and, and when you ask the price, oh, how much do you think my horse is worth? The next question you would, how many have you sold for that sort of money? There's so many people going around pricing horses and they never sold a horse more than 20 grand in their life, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and they're, ju- they're just hearing a little bit of hearsay. Mm-hmm. I've seen more people in my life miss the boat by asking too much money than people that get the jackpot. Mm-hmm. Always, 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 always. There's always a moment. There's always that moment. The horse walks out of the main ring in Dublin and it's got a rosette on it. And someone walks down and says, how much is your horse? Oh, I'm not selling it. Bang, you have missed your moment in life. It's done, it's gone. You will, whatever's in your head, you can have it. And that happens more than the person saying, I want to keep it. And then they keep it and they get more money. Now, sometimes that also happens, but you want to be very, 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 very sure. And look for all the things, the rideability, the easiness, the, the scope, the stride, the model, you know, the x-rays, you have to look for all of those to go forward. So basically what I'm hearing is it's really not simple to formulate the equation to value horses. So there's no, we're selling emotion. Mm. You know what I mean? It's easier to sell art. You just Google up there. What did the, what did the Picasso make last week in Hong Kong? Oh, there you go. I have the full brother of it here. I'll sell it for that. You know, it, it, it's, we're selling emotion and you've got to be able to read it. And, and the, pa- the, the power is with the buyer. Yes, uh, the power is with the buyer, but you need it to be with the buyer, buyer, you know, and the time somebody comes, that's the time to do it. You know, a lot of the time, a lot of agents looking as well. We, we would sell 50 percent, 50, 60 percent through agents all, all the time. Yeah, it is always. And what sort that, of commissions are involved there, Barry? Uh, 10 to 15 percent. Mm-hmm. Depends. 10 to 15 percent. Sometimes they do profit splits with them. Mm-hmm. If they market the horse, they might take it for a while. They might say, I'll split the profit. You might be there for six months, might be there for a year, you know, mm-hmm. ages, they'll, they'll add some value. But they have, uh, they would, a good agent now is on the road 24 seven finding horses, but they also solve problems. You know what I mean? They also bring the deal over. They also know how to, you know, there's, there's something on an x-ray. Well, they would convince the buyer, why don't you take an extra, send them back, take an extra angle. Why don't you get a second opinion? Sometimes a sentence, sometimes a sentence and a suggestion in a horse deal makes you go forward. Mm-hmm. And that comes from years and years and years and years mm-hmm. of experience mm-hmm. and trust from the buyer to the agent. You know, mm-hmm. a lot of buyers, agents to protect them. I would use a lot of agents, a lot, a lot of agents in, in, in different countries. And I would trust them. In the odd time I would buy a horse without seeing it, but that's not a good practice. Yeah, indeed. And I did want to talk a little bit, but, but as I'm watching the clock as well, I think what I'm going to do now is I'm going to share share a couple of videos that we're going to talk about in brief, and then we can come back to some more, some other questions then after that. So um, okay. let's hope this works. Um, are you able to see that screen there now? Harry? Yep, yeah, I can see it. Yep. Can I see that? Yep. Yeah. So talk us through um, Balu Lux. I've lost you now at the moment. As an no, that's okay. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Okay. So this is a horse that's owned mm-hmm. by uh, Jenny Rankin, Nisha Wilson, and Marie Wilson, her uh, Nisha's mom. And it's a really, really nice uh, four-year-old that's placed in a couple of the four-year-old classes, especially at the end of the year. It was quite green during the beginning of the year because we were away and we had to, mm-hmm. we had to, um, uh you know we had to let it out in the field but at the end of the year it really came around right you know it's a really flashy horse there's a good bit of interest in it and i think the girls will probably run it another year uh aim it at the fiber all classes for next year mm-hmm. okay and um you know i suppose obviously you know the other part of the equation for you is having good rider uh to work with and you have a very good rider that you yeah. work with and that's, yeah. that's such a huge part of what you do. Yeah. So I'm going to, I'm going to move on to, um, to this one here. 
and maybe talk to us about Imar or Imar, or however you pronounce yeah. it. This is our new horse. This we, we bought this. Um, is that video playing all right there? Is it? Yeah. Should be, I think. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> this is a horse. This is the jump off of the Grand Prix. Uh, he is nine years old and he is by Carrera, BDL Carrera. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a new horse we have and we are very lucky to have just secured him in the last week. Uh, together with some investors and we are aiming him at uh, four and five stars next year I put my head on the block here now I would like I would hope to think that we'll jump some teams with him next year okay and you know the qualities that that he has he's a big stride big canter big tall good looking gelding not a mark on his legs not a mark not a bump not a turn Really nice, good sound horse. Uh, very careful, great technique in front. A little bit late, and you could say a little stiff behind. But he's getting better and better every day. We're we're, the, we're extremely, extremely lucky to have him. And he took a good bit of finding and dogging and dealing to to dig him out of where he was. You know. Okay, but uh, you have him now, and good luck. Yeah, 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 exactly. yeah. We're delighted to have him. Okay, and another one we'll just have a quick look at here now is um, Ibiza. Yeah, this is Ibiza. He's owned by a group we put together called the Blackwood Group, uh, a couple of friends of ours. And um, he's also a nine-year-old horse. He's by Inshallah de Mous. He's a beautiful, beautiful horse. This is him jumping in Bowlsworth, his first show, like athletic, soft through the body, great canters. Great, great cant. Both of these horses have great canters. They're kind of different. This guy would be, you know, a little bit more supple in his body, perhaps, but he's also a horse that's very exciting. Now, we haven't put the gun to his head yet. We're probably going to stay here for the second tour and um, we're going to, you know, just grab the edge him up. He's jumping around 140s, National Grand Prix at home. So he probably end up jumping ranking classes, 145 classes by the end of the tour. Mm -hmm. Okay. And for those who haven't been to a tour before, and, and I, I can include me in that, um, Barry, you know, what's it like out there? What's the what's the advantages um, of going Sunshine. to these tours? Sunshine. Mm, sunshine, come on. <laughs> you can go a little bit further than the sunshine, surely. <laughs> I, got, I smile on my face at half seven in the morning. Uh, I'm having my one bowl of cornflakes, but no, sunshine, it, it's, uh, big rings, big warm up rings. Uh, the warm up rings wouldn't be so big here, but big rings competing, which is extremely important for young horses. Most of our rings at home are too small. 80% mm -hmm. of our rings at home are too small. Um, you can't be going to a big outdoor ring with a horse to uh, uh, to get a bit of balance, get a uh, build a bit of strength, uh, get the greenness out of them. You can't beat it. You know, we we don't go to any small rings anymore. Good surfaces. It, it's Great course building. I, I, once you do that three times a week with a young horse and you do it for two or three weeks in a row, you can, it's worth about, you know, maybe three months at home sometimes, you know? You mm -hmm. depend, you know? And, and that's kind of where I was coming to next. Like obviously, you know, you've, you've made the point that it's expensive to go to these these type of venues, but, you know, there has to be a payback to it as well. And and, and that's in, in the in the production side for the horse. And, and I presume it's also a very good um, place to, to be seen to, to, to market yourself as well, too. Yeah, it's good marketing. It's definitely good marketing to be here. Um, you also get to see other breeds. You get to hear what's going on. You know, I mean, you're at the crossroads of international trade here, which is great. Uh, um, uh, but you know, you 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 have to come here with a purpose. And you know, some people bring their horse to enjoy them. You know, mm. you know, the, there's some uh, other people here from Ireland that they said they took the week off, the, the month off, and you know, they got the time off work, and it's fantastic. You know, and there's other people here to produce their horse, like ourselves. We have two seven-year-olds here at Cornus Belensky um, and uh, their numero uno was the other one. Yes, thanks. I can remember reading. And we are producing them in the seven-year-old classes. You know, one is getting a bit fitter. The other is kind of moving up the grades a little bit, getting looking for the right ability, changing bits. When you're doing, when you're at the show consistently, mm -hmm. you can tweak things, tweak things, tweak things, you know, on a consistent basis. And hopefully after three weeks, you can... You know get to the point you know mm -hmm. and is there jumping there every day yeah it starts tuesday wednesday it's an easy thing to no one should have any fear of going to a tour and seeing 
can say you can go with your keep app and look at the young horse look at the old horse you know Ryanair flight is 100 quid uh, you can buy you can get uh, cheap hotels cheap cars you know go two or three together come for three or four days there's, there's one in, uh, there's one here there's one in Vahir there's one in Portugal uh, and why not and there's also sunshine which you won't see until the 15th of April next year maybe okay. you know <laughs> Yes, well, I can validate it's been a very miserable day in the West out here today, so it has. Um, I want to come back to some of the questions that have come in from, from, from viewers here as well. Um, there's one in, would an isolated chip near no joints put you off? An isolated chip near, no, no it wouldn't. Mm -hmm. um, getting, there's um, another query here about, I suppose, Ireland's international reputation and um, you know, like how you see that now from your experiences traveling and what others are saying to you, has it improved? If so, how? And, um, you know, how do we build on that going forward? Okay, at the moment, there's no brand, there's very little brand loyalty. Uh, I, I had friends uh, years ago that would only buy in Holstein because they had great canters and scope. Mm -hmm. I have other people that will only buy in France because they love the blood. I have other people that love the Belgian breed because they think it's the interaction of all breeds in Europe. Other people like the Dutch because it's so commercial. Other people, you know, yada, yada, yada. Yeah. There's no, there's, I have people ringing me about Irish horses all the time. Mm -hmm. um, we are, we do have a marketing advantage because we're the first stop for a lot of these guys that left after the crash of 08, between 08 and 011 to America. So we're, we're at the crossroads. We have better access to America than any other European country, believe it or not. Um, but Ireland's reputation, yeah, it's got a lot stronger, a lot, lot stronger. You know, they're a bit wary of us because we ride bloody good, but, you know, but no one, no one really cares that the brand loyalty has gone out of it. It's gone. You know, it, it's, you know, it, it, it's gone. It's like years ago, if somebody had money, they drove a Mercedes. And that's all they drove. Now they drive Audis, Mercedes, Land Rovers. You know, it, it's yeah. we've become one of the breed. You know, they yeah. they they go to Cavan now. They, sorry, they go to Lanarkin now, and they they didn't have belief that Irish horses had scope for years, mm -hmm. and they were right. We didn't have enough scope in them. We didn't have enough stride. Didn't have enough blood. Mm -hmm. And now we have James Can Cruz, and like he can jump over the back of some of their horses while they're jumping the same jump. Mm -hmm. So. You know, and, and, I, and I have to say, kudos to Shane and Pat and all that they do yeah, there. Must Shane and Pat, they did yeah. they did an excellent job. I do a bit of business with them, and they are probably the most professional breeders I've mm -hmm. I've known. Yeah. Um, there's an there's another query here in about the U.S. hunter market. Um, they spend well. It's a different animal. What's your perspective? Uh, U.S. Hunt, I would be breeding hunters to be honest. Uh, hunters are sort of they they like them a little downhill they like them daisy cutter movers um if you start to breed them that's fine you know what i mean you can sell them as it they're a very specialized market and there's only one road for them and that's the hunter market um yeah it's good just look up a video green hunters in america and you can find out what it is you know it people say they can't jump but they can they have to have a they have to have scope in a different way, stand off, gap the jump, put their knees up around their chin. You know, it's a very specialized market. And if they don't change legs, they are worth zero. And I mean, absolutely zero, no money whatsoever. Don't put it on the plane. Don't send it to me. Don't send me another video, please. They, they actually, they're worth absolutely nothing if they haven't got good rideability. And, you know, like that, that question kind of crossed my mind as well. Like you, you, you travel as we said so much, and you are looking at horses in Belgium, in Holland, in Germany, and, and wherever else, um, you know, how is the production comparing here now? Is it improving, uh, you know, and are you, like when you're out hunting as well for, for horses to fulfill your, your client customer lists, are you able to find what you need here? I mean, I, I, I see no. even in your list of what you have in Aliva, like you have a Danish horse, you have Dutch horses, you have one Irish. Is there yeah. is there a still a supply issue here in your mind? Uh, the, yeah, there's still a supply issue here. There's more room for the, the foreigners do numbers easier. You know what I mean? They're able to they're able to cut costs a little bit more, I think, than we are, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, they build their farm for it. 
Mm-hmm. You know, their their four pens or sheds, the way they, they made them muck them out, the way they add the straw. You know what I mean? One per- I know a guy who was 100 folds in the one shed and one person can do them in an hour in the morning and an hour and 10 minutes. You, you know, he, he, of course, being Dutchy out of the 10 minutes, you know, in the evening. Um, so they, they've built it accordingly. You know, they've built it accordingly. You know, so the production levels here, I think the production is good. We need better facilities. We definitely need better facilities. You know, we have... We have good facilities for what Europe had 10 years ago, but they are building bigger, better, bigger, better, bigger, better. And and the department need to get off their ass and, and do something about it. Okay. Um, do you think it's necessary to travel to international shows to compete is another question that's here. It doesn't really specify what age class it, or whatnot. It, it is. Uh, you can't sell a potential... Uh, um, you can't sell a potential international horse from a national show. You know, yes, you can. There's always an exception. Everybody has a neighbor that has an exception. But, you know, if you want to sell a horse, it's got to have the experience. It's got the market, the videos, view a video from three or four different types of shows all over the place. It's worth more than the same three videos from the same place. So, yes, there's marketing in it. There's experience in it, you you, you know. So, yeah, it is it is important to travel once your horses are are older. Mm another question here um which i kind of feel you've sort of answered anyway um is flat work important to young young show jumpers or is the price received mostly dependent on their jump and you've really stressed like the importance of balance and changing legs and you know all of that well, so, flat work improves the jump yeah uh, you know the flat work really improves the jump and the strength and the soundness of the horse mm-hmm. if a horse goes the right way it's more likely to be sound you know uh another question here are the show jumping fraternity um going off or interested in really big horses what's your preferred height uh 16 two and a half um, don't like horses even though i have one of them i don't <laughs> like small horses i made an exception for her but i don't like small horses because you're you're if you go back to what i said about you know you're, you're you you've this picture uh, of a of a the, the perfect animal in your mind you know if it's a little small you're taking away 20 25 percent of the customers you know if it's if it doesn't ride well you're taking away 30 35 percent of the customer etc cetera, etc cetera. so yeah the size in horses doesn't matter the size of horses doesn't matter like a 16 2 16 2 and a half 16 3 mm-hmm. that's the size you know yeah. used to have this rubbish oh a, a junior rider mm, nobody wants small horses anymore nobody wants Mm-hmm. Okay. some people will sell them and they're like oh I have an exception everybody's a little exception yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I know I'm hopping and jumping here I'm, I'm actually just trying to track the questions that are coming in as well Barry. so excuse the, yeah. the, the little bit of, of, of moving around the place but there is another question here that's relating back to your um, your valuation explanations around your your meter meter 35 horse there earlier on for the american market and it's it's asking it in the context of how to value the same horse with the same qualities but with the potential for a meter 40 or a ranking class and probably a little bit more but you know if you have a five-year-old you know you've still two seasons to produce them so the current person that wants to buy them has a, has 20 or thirty thousand to go into the horse already you know so that that margin, that, that person that will buy them and is ready to buy them will look for that margin for, them, for themselves, which they should get. You know, it's like selling, selling suckler calves or something like that. You know what I mean? You can't get the price of the animal in the factory. You, you, you know, and the odd time, maybe you get some lunatic that gives it to you, but you won't get a consistent price that way. I'm a bit worried, to be honest, Wendy, about, you know, the, you know, and I sell, I can sell a horse expensive and ask a lot of money, but I also know it's a gamble. There, there's a huge amount of people missing, missing w- with selling their horses because of hype. You know, the, the, the emotion should be all, all, all with the buyer and there should be absolutely no emotion with yourself. You know, can you afford to take the gamble? Can you afford to take half of the horse if you make the, if you make the decision? You know, what could you do with the money? Could you go and buy that black type horse, that, that black type mare? You really have to have the business and the risks and the costs worked out in your head before you open your mouth when someone says, hello, is your horse for sale? You know, you, 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 and you have to be ready to go, ready to go. Yeah. To have your, have your homework done and be in yeah. the position of knowledge at the end of the day, that old adage, knowledge is power, and it yeah. is at the end of the day because it allows you then to make your decisions and, and make and them in the right time frame. Yeah, experience is knowledge as well. So, you know, 
you know, if you haven't experienced that situation, you know, cool your jets for a minute and ring somebody that you trust. Build a network of people that you actually trust that have done it before, mm. that have done it before, you know. Mm. And they are there. Uh, listen, I, I get videos of horses and before I buy them, I, I might send them to one or two people and say, give me your opinion on it. Mm. And I've, I've um, you know, some great friends, you know, one friend would say, are, are you drinking? You know. <laughs> The other person that says, can I buy half or you, 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 you get lots of, you, you know, I, I deal with people that give me black and white views on things. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, there, are, there is another question here about valuation. Do you want me to go there? I don't care. Go ahead. Yeah, no problem. Uh, how do you value a horse of eight or nine years of age when it can jump meter 40, meter 50? Well, if it's jumping consistently meter 40, meter 50, is it going clear? Is it easy? Uh, is it riding in a snaffle? You, you know what I mean? Is it blood? Is it competitive? Is it, is, is, is it good to, to take an amateur around? You know, if it ticks all those boxes, I'm surprised it's still in Ireland. You know what I mean? It's, it's um, meter 40, meter 50. You know, the, you're getting into the realms of big, big money. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, the, uh, some of them, you know, I know a guy was offering me, you know, one there yesterday that jumped to Nations Cup. And he, he wants 120,000 for it. Why? Because it's not careful enough. It just jumped a Nations Cup and was a bit shocked. It was one of the three stars early in his career. And, and now it's just not careful enough and it's a bit awkward and a bit plain. And it's not really for the American market. And he wants to get out, you know, but on paper, oh my God, it's jumped a Nations Cup. It must be worth a million. Yeah. No, it's, yeah. it, it's yeah. worth it. You have to think yeah. that the, 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 the person buying it is sort of, uh, the real top of the market is America. So let, we'll make no qualms about that. Uh -huh. And those people ride with a very light hand and a light leg and a uh -huh. forward seat. They will not support the front. Oh, just uh -huh. give it a little help in front. No, they won't. Uh -huh. You know, you have to just get after a little bit. No, they won't. Uh -huh. They'll buy the next one. They'll get off that one. They'll go to the next bar and they'll buy the next one, the next one. Uh -huh. So if your horse has these attributes, which make it, make it a little difficult for the person, you, you can just, Keep not taking a little bit off what you think the top price is, you know. Mm -hmm. So that that's and that, that's how we value them. You, you know what I mean? Let someone else take the risk. You know, there's always somebody out there that thinks they'll do better than you. You know what I mean? So, mm -hmm. you, you know, or you know, that would suit a client that kicks a lot or that's a little active in the saddle. But there's only very few of them. You know, most most American riders follow the horse around the ring. You know, they don't create the jump or keep it in a shape. So, so yeah, you have to think about those things as well. Mm -hmm. There is another another question here. Do the mothers or the dams, excuse me, need to have competed at a particular level or have a particular level of black type in their pedigree, a particular level of performance in their pedigree? Yeah, this is this is a bit of an old with respect to the person's asking, and mm -hmm. thank you for sending in a question. But this is an old chestnut that you say something and 10 people say, Well, I bred something. Mm -hmm. They may they have to be so when I look at horse telex. And I see that three horses have gone to America, level two, level three, level four. That tells me that they're balanced and they've good x-rays. Uh, something has to have happened. But if they have eight and they have big duck eggs behind them, that there's no information, they've never jumped higher than a meter 10, I would be highly suspicious that they're useless. Um, but mares can miss a line. You know, I've often seen that if you look down some of the, a lot of the pedigrees, you know, it can skip a generation, it can throw back, but there has to be some sort of quality, some sort of quality in the blood. You've got to see some print that, you know, some of them went to America, some of them jumped here, some of them went to venting. Eventing means that they're probably sound, they're good movers, you, you know, they're brave, they're good gallop, good wind. You know, something has to have happened in it. No. The mare can breed horses that hasn't competed, mm. but it probably is better that her, her sisters and her mother did or somebody did with the family, you know, but she mm. wasn't the only employed one in the couch. Good analogy. Um, another question here. Is it cheaper to buy a meter 35 proven horse in Europe than here at home? Yes. Um, Why? Uh, we have more American scouts around here. They're eaten up all the time. We have a very good, strong national young rider, uh, um, young rider uh, uh, sort of circuit, which is only getting stronger, by the way, which is only getting strong. I can see that getting stronger at home now, judging by the, the numbers of people. But yeah, it, it is. It, it's hard at the moment uh, because the buying season for America is sort of from August to January. So it's hard to get at the moment, but it is, yeah, I would think it is. Mm -hmm. 
Um, there is another question here. In terms of buying horses, would it be true to say that the traditional Irish sport horse is still the most popular breed among foreigners at the amateur level? Most commonly foreigners, and I presume that's including Europe, UK, America, um, come here looking for TIHs rather than the warm blood. Would that be true in your view? No. No, there's no there's no brand loyalty. You know, it's it's they, they'll say, you know, that no, no, it, it's and people are selling this, which kind of annoys me. Uh, it really does. I, I know people in the in the traditional movement and I respect what they do. And I've talked to them about the different marketing and, you know, how could we spot thoroughbreds and how could we. But but there, there's a there's a, a load of rubbish that's talked about it. Oh, there's people that come over and all they want. To, maybe there is, but there's a small amount. Of, I don't meet them. Small, small, small amount of people. Oh, we'll only buy an eventer if there's no foreign bloodline in it. Well, go and ask a couple of the bigger traders of eventers now, and they want a bit of foreign blood in it. But we use these words foreign. I'm just after saying it here as, as if it's a negative, you know. You know, there's no another wide story. Oh, the Germans came over here and bought all our thoroughbreds. No, they didn't. That's more absolute old wives' tales rubbish. It's time to get with the market. There, there is a market for traditionally Irish bred horses, but not because it's on their passport, but because they're good, solid horses that are well broken, well brought up. One of the things when no one attributes in Ireland is the land that they're brought up on, the experiences of an Irish horse, the way that they're broken, the way that they're ridden. This is the one thing that we can actually sort of uh, not overtake, but we can take that part of the market uh, uh, away. We have a lot more amateurs coming here uh, to buy horses than they would go to France. We have a lot of people from England and Scandinavia. They want to, oh, I want, a, I want a horse to do one star eventing. I want a horse to jump 120. I want a starter horse. I want a hunter. I want, uh, you, you know, uh, a simple hacking horse or something. That's why we have that trade because they, 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 do, they do want to buy it from our countryside and that. But I don't see a lot of brand loyalty. And I would not breed a horse, traditionally Irish horse, because you think that that will be an advantage to sell the horse. I would try and breed a good animal first. And if it has traditional bloodlines only, well done, fantastic. If you think that's a better choice in using an outside breed, do it without a doubt. But I, I wouldn't personally, personally, I wouldn't do it as a as a uh, um, I, I wouldn't do it as a, a sort of a business decision. Like James Can Cruz is Irish bred. Um, there's a, 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 another question here, and I, I am going to start mo moving towards wrap up then. Um, and it is along the lines of: Is owning horses worth it for the owner, or can owning horses be worth it for the owner? Is that a monetary or a, an enjoyment? I would guess in a monetary sense. Yeah, it can be. It can be. But you've got to, you can't just buy horses and, you know, sit at home and watch television and play a bit of golf and ring up the rider after three or four months if you're making me any money. You know what I mean? I think you've got to, you've got to get into the realities. of it. It's a gamble. You are gambling. You're putting it down. You can, you can manipulate, uh, uh, for the want of a more positive word, than manipulate, but you, you, you can add value to, to the animal. But you, you've got to, what's your goal? Is it to sell? Is it to keep going on? You have the one superstar that pays for all of them. What's your gamble? What's your exposure? What's your risk? How good is your horse? Never you're, you're a strategic gambler. So you're not you just to, a gambler. You're be a strategic. It's like buying a stocks, stocks and shares. You know, what do you do when you buy stocks? You know, you do a, a physical uh, sort of a, an accounting investigation in, in, into everything. And then that's your that's your vetting. That's your that's your trial. And then you then you add bits and value as you go along. But then you ooh, hang on a minute. Now, this horse is performing well. Pull the plug. Get out. You know, get 75 percent of your money back Get 125 percent of your money back. So let's get out of here. Or this this is a bad bet. Mm -hmm. Yes, it can be very advantageous and it can really supplement people's income. But you but you, you've got to be dealing with people that know what they're talking about, like in like in any other business, you know. Yeah. So. You know, being the fact that you have been such an advocate for the sector here um, in recent years and uh, dare I say, I suppose, a, a, a bit of a, a, a politician to boot alongside that. What you know, aspirations do you have for the um, for the industry here at this at this stage for the next 
aspirations. For the next number of years. Aspirations. There what aspirations? It. What wishes? If you were, what's your wish list now? What would you like to see happen? I, I would, would like, like to see change I, inside of the next five years. Five years. I'd like to see us emulate the uh, uh, the racing industry in Ireland. Racing industry in Ireland get eighty or ninety million a year. They are fantastic. They are organised. They're out in front of everything. They lead the world. Whenever John Magner made a very good point, he said, whenever there's high end horse sport, which is racing, you'll always hear Irish accents. And I love that, which is true. And the same is being said for show jumping. But uh, what would I like to see? I would like to see uh, most of the higher end structures coming together, HSI, SGI, uh, the horse board, um, RDS uh, coming together even a little bit more. I think that they're going through some changes at the moment. Um, but I'd like to see them come and Chagas, of course, coming together, you know, to work more as a unit unit. I'm very disappointed with uh, the support from the Department of Agriculture. They, I know they're changing and one thing, but we, oh, we get an excuse every year. There's some they're fantastic. I've met a lot of the politicians and they're actually fantastic human beings. And I met most of, and I know the the, the senior um, civil servants have changed recently, but they're they're quite good. But they're so busy to to try and attract attention, you, you know, to to, uh, to focus on you know, you know what we are. We are an alternative agricultural industry, and we have so much potential for rural Ireland. Now, and our our export market is more effective i think the, the spread of the horse business is more effective than the thoroughbred business it affects more people it helps smaller families in 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 income and one horse i'll get to my point in a minute and one horse gives you know seven or eight sort of uh, uh jobs you know the person that makes the hay the bedding the feed the farrier the 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 uh the vet you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's very, very important in rural Ireland. What would I like? To, I would like to see that. I would like to see the industry sort of understand what value that they have to rural Ireland. Everything outside the M50. I think I'm the only yard inside the M50 now at the moment. Uh, oh, there's maybe two or three more. But uh, um, I, I would like to see them have a sort of a, a better sense of identity. Uh, um, and I'd like to see more investment in the facilities we have. The facilities we have are behind Europe. And as long as they're behind Europe, we'll be behind Europe. Mm -hmm. But um, at skill, Young Breeders, fantastic award. Lanak and fantastic. Inter the amount of international riders, the breeding in the country is turning around at breakneck speed. Mm -hmm. Anybody that's doing it seriously is getting returns on it. You can only just see the bigger breeding farms are making money at it. They're making really good money at it. And I, I think the full sales are improving, the turnout of the full sales, the interest of the full sales. So the ship is turning, but but it needs it needs serious fuel and it needs another couple of engines on the back of it. And, and we're going to have to, in, in sort of a very constructive way, uh, uh, deal with the department, get more investment in education, in infrastructure, stop with the excuses. Mm -hmm. You know, the, 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 the couple of breeding lobby groups, they did fantastic, to get included in TAMS. I'm not sure if it's going to change anybody's life, but it, it, for me, the most important thing that those guys achieved there was recognition. Recognition that equine farming is important. Mm -hmm. And uh, because it's seen as a bit of a hobby and it's not, it's a bloody business. It, 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 it pays mortgages. It, it sends kids to college. It, it, it pays for life. Absolutely. So uh, I, I would like to see. You've got a, like a nomination to... here to go forward for, um, for um, um, ministerial duties. Pardon me? You have a nomination here to go forward for ministerial duties. No chance. No chance. No chance. I've done, I, I, oh. I think I should serve on a, you know, I'm sorry to, Wendy, let's say there's some breeders, let's pick any county, let's say there's breeders in Sligo. Let's say you get 10 breeders in Sligo. The best thing they can do for the market is help the local hunt, the local show, the local pony club. Why? You're going to create the market for your horses. Get off your ass, get together, get down the night before, put up the course, take it down the day of, make sure the pony club have enough members, have enough have enough people to make sandwiches have enough the infrastructure of the of the of the free sport has to be looked after i give you know i'm i'm no saint i give plenty back i did the three years on the 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 
the lobby committee, I do the RDS, I've done some other projects, but if you want to improve things in your locality and in your country, just, just spend two or three years, get a couple of mates and do something worthwhile that gives back to the whole, because that activity will only play into your hands for the future. Mm -hmm. And we're missing a little bit of that. You know, the breeders came together there recently. You know, the Roscommon breeders and that, and then a, a few other groups, and they got TAMs, and they got TAMs. And that's fantastic. But they should keep going more and more, keep pushing. Mm -hmm. So what's your, your final piece of advice for breeders, producers here this evening before we say goodnight and thank you very much? Uh, it's emotional business, and you got to love it for the emotion side of it. you got to be ready for the ups and the downs, the tears and the laughter. But it's a business. And don't think just because you've got five mares that you're sort of, ah, sure, it's a bit of a hobby. No, it's not. There's a horse in there that could buy the farm next door and you get rid of that neighbor you don't like. You know, I, 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 I think you I think like a business and think that it's all possible. It's all possible. Think like a business. Improve your standard. Improve your standard. Join your network. I don't care what, if you live on top of a mountain somewhere or if you live in a, you have a back garden with a mare in it, improve the standard of what you're doing. Find those mares. That's the biggest thing that you can do. Get off the phone tonight, get off Instagram, Facebook, get on the horse telex, find a couple of really fine mares and do it. And if you can't afford that mare, try and split it into shares and buy a really good foal. Find the mares for breeders, find the mares. And they will not, you won't find them buy and sell. You won't find them, you know, at the side of a, uh, you know, you'll only get the old rubbish that people are trying to breed or get rid of mares. Find the lines and uh, and buy them and keep them then, you know. Mm -hmm. That's what I would do. Well, I'm very grateful to you because you are an hour ahead of us tonight. And, no um, you know, we've, 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 kept, we've kept you a bit later than was anticipated. Um, Losing our cards anyway, you probably saved me money. <laughs> Well, listen, I, I wish uh, yourself and, and of course Jenny and the team that's there uh, continue. Nisha and Ashling, uh, and uh, we're very lucky to have both of them. They do. Yeah, fun, they do to help me out with the names. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah. Um, you do a good job and uh, keep the flag flying. And um, yeah, look at uh, come back and source some of the source some of the offspring here off of. Oh, um, gladly, gladly, absolutely no problem. Nothing against them. <laughs> Traditional Irish breads, if they're good enough, absolutely no problem. We'll buy all of them. Yeah. yeah. So Thanks, Wendy. I, I bid you good night and I bid our listeners tonight good night as well. And the next webinar in this series is on Tuesday, November 8th. And Robert Walker will be joining me from the UK. So a different topic. And I look forward to that. And uh, again, a huge appreciation to everybody who's committed their time here this evening.